are continuing our series through the book of Colossians. Paul is writing to this small church in Greece in the first century and explaining to them, not only reminding them and encouraging them what Christ has called them to be as believers, as a church, both individually and together in this city, but also he's encouraging them to stay strong, not only in their faith individually, but also stay strong against a doctrine that was beginning to permeate into the church there in Colossae. It was uh, it was the doctrine basically is called Gnosticism. It was the idea that Jesus was, rather than being a real man who came to save us, to die and save us, he was some sort of a spiritual force that in the universe there was the, the good force and the bad force, and Jesus was part of that good force, and that we needed to do certain kind of secret, secret rituals to be able to be part of the good force rather than the bad force. And the idea was that Paul, what these Gnostic heretics were coming in and basically trying to tell the Colossians was that if they, they had part of the truth, part of the gospel with Jesus and Paul and what he had taught, but they needed the full gospel. They needed a deeper knowledge. And Paul, in writing to them, is telling them, no, you have the full gospel. The full gospel is that you are a sinner, you are alienated from God. That's part of what we're going to go through in these three verses that we're going to look at today. You are alienated from God, you are his enemy, you are estranged from him, the relationship was broken, and Christ made you right with God. He redeemed you. He took you from slavery to sin, being oriented towards sin, living under the burden of sin, and being unable to get out from that, and brought you into the domain, into the kingdom of God and his beloved Son, who's Christ. And the only way that we can be saved is by believing in the name of Jesus through the grace of God that he sent Jesus and by our own faith to believe that Jesus is truly who he claims to have been, that he's God, that he's the savior of the world, and that he alone can pay the price for our sins so that we can be made right with God. I mean, Paul is saying this is the full gospel. This is what you've been called to believe in. You don't need all the extra bells and whistles of what these Gnostics and other heretics are trying to claim that you need to believe in. And so where we've been so far, we've seen his encouragement in the first several verses of the chapter. Uh, and then we've seen Paul really theologizes and you have this wonderful, deep uh, section in verses 15 through 20 where Paul really exudes about who Jesus is. And he talks about how Jesus is the image of God. He's the firstborn of all creation. He is the one who is supreme. He is the one for whom we exist. Not only do we exist by Christ, but we exist to make him great. Every breath that we exude out of our lungs proclaims the glory of Christ. And Paul has finished talking about who Jesus is. He's going to come back to it later on in chapter 2 when he says, you all have been trying to grasp shadows, to grasp avatars, but they're all fake. They're all illusory. You need to find the substance that's Christ. This is really a main theme that runs all the way through the book. But here, he's going to back up a little bit from where he's just been talking about Christ and say, don't forget about your salvation. So in, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, don't forget about your salvation. Don't forget about who you were, that you were alienated from God. Don't forget about what you are now, that you're reconciled to God. That relationship that was broken before has been fixed and restored. And don't forget about what God has called you to continue in, and don't forget 
what God will do at the end of time. So that's basically the structure of these three verses. It's what we're going to cover in this section. And so first of all, Paul says, we were alienated from God. That's his, his first reminder to the Colossian believers in this passage. We were alienated from God. And you really see that in verse 21. He says, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. I'm throwing these all up together because they're really a unit. It's hard to break apart this, these couple of verses. But he starts by reminding them of what they were. They were alienated from God. That relationship was broken. We did not want to have anything to do with God. We didn't like his commands. We didn't like his character. We didn't like his will, what he was calling us to do. Because, you see, God created us for relationship with himself. But because God is holy, he calls us to live out that same holiness that he is. And often human nature, and certainly since the fall, since Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God, our lives are in a lot of ways, defined by the pull between do we go our own way or do we go God's way? That's part of what we looked at last week. Who's the God of your life? Is Jesus the God of your life or is your own desires, your own hopes and purposes, are those what directs what you do in your life? God is calling us to far more than what we think we should be doing in our lives and what the world offers as far as what can satisfy our comfort and our security and our, our identity needs that we all have as humans. Christ calls us to more than that. And we lived in opposition to God, not only in our minds and how we thought, but in our deeds, what we said, what we did. We ran the opposite way from God. Paul in a way, in this verse, is reaching back to what he said in Colossians 1, just what we talked about just a few weeks ago in verses 13 through 14, earlier in this same chapter, where he said, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, we're alienated from God, but we've been transferred out of that, and that's where he goes next. We we're alienated from God. We were estranged from God, but we didn't stay there. Because of what Christ did on the cross, we were reconciled. And so the second point that Paul makes is that we were reconciled. We were made right with God. Reconciliation is the idea of if two people are in a fight and somebody comes in and says, whoa, 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 back up. You explain what, what went wrong. You explain what went wrong. Let's talk this through. There's a mediator. Jesus Christ is our mediator. He reconciled us to God by stopping the fight and showing us we were wrong and that we needed to ask forgiveness and repent and, and change our ways so that we could be made right with God. It's a, it's a relational term. So we're reconciled with God. So... This is in verse 22. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. He's reconciled us in his body. And by the way, the fact that he says his body of his flesh, those are two different words in the Greek. Part of the reason Paul emphasizes this, it may seem a little redundant. Like if he died in his body, then he died in his flesh. Seems fairly straightforward. But Remember, part of the heresy that Paul was battling against that was coming into the Colossian church was the idea that Jesus wasn't really incarnate. He wasn't really a man. He didn't have a real body. He was some kind of spiritual force. And so Paul is just hitting really hard every time he can. Jesus Christ is God, yes, but he came as a man in a body of flesh like ours. That's what Hebrews chapter 2 gets to. Because we're made of flesh, Christ came in the flesh, 
so that he could die in our place. And so Paul is again hammering the gospel. The gospel, the crux of the gospel is Christ as a man. If you don't have that, you have nothing. Our, our gospel is meaningless without that piece. It's the linchpin of what we believe. And so he's hammering that hard in this section. But for our purposes too, we see we've been reconciled. We're no longer alienated. So this first part of the verse, or in verse 21, that's past tense. If you believed in the name, name of Jesus and confessed him as your Lord, verse 21 is past tense for you. That no longer applies to you. Now, verse 22 is where we're at. We've been reconciled. And in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21, he says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. So here he's taking the reconciliation part and saying, not only have you been reconciled, but it's your duty to go and as an ambassador, what does an ambassador do? They go to another country, sometimes a hostile country, and seek to make the will and the, the purposes of that country align better with their own country. And so we're ambassadors who are going out preaching the message of reconciliation. We're saying, we serve a king who's going to dominate the world. And the rest of the world needs to know that just stockpiling arsenals of weapons against God is not going to work. And so we're preaching the message saying, you don't have to try to go into nuclear war against God. You can make it right by changing, instead of being hostile to God, by repenting and coming back in relationship with God. That's, that's our role as ambassadors of God. So he says, continuing on, we implore you, this is Paul talking to the Corinthians, but also talking to unsaved people outside of the church. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God for our sake. And I would argue verse 21 is one of the most key, succinct verses on the gospel. For our sake, he made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness of God. That is the core of reconciliation, and ultimately, it's the core of the gospel. That Christ, who knew no sin, was perfectly sinless as God, became sin for us so that we could be made right with God. We could have the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks on us, he doesn't see our sin and our brokenness, but he sees God He's, God sees Christ and his perfection, his sinlessness. That's what the cross accomplished for us. And this reconciliation has been completed. This is the, the reconciliation, if you're a believer today, is done. It, it has continuing effect in your life, but it's done. But the next point that Paul goes to is to say the purpose of our reconciliation, this is point number three, the purpose of our reconciliation was not just so that we might be in right relationship with God, but even prior to that, that we might be presented perfect, holy, and blameless. So, the purpose for our reconciliation was so that Jesus Christ could present us, you, both individually and as a church, everyone who believes in God, in Jesus and his death, to present us wholly before God. And so in verse, in verse 23, it says, He is now reconciled in his body, verse 22, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So do you see how Paul is building his argument in these two verses, 21 and 22? We're alienated, but now we've been reconciled. Why were we reconciled? We were reconciled so that we could be presented holy and blameless and 
before God the Father. That's the end goal. Now, this is the battle that we wrestle through as believers. We are not perfect now. We are not perfectly holy and blameless now. But this is where we're headed. Now, it's interesting, as I was pre- preparing for this sermon earlier this week, I had a couple of our local friends from the Mormon church show up at my door wanting to talk about the Bible, which I always kind of enjoy in a sick way. Um, <laughs> the, like, on the one hand, and I always, by the way, if you ever have uh, someone from either the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, and, and if you're not sure who those groups are, you can ask me afterwards. They're, they believe that Jesus is not sufficient to be the Savior. So they, they're not, they would say they're Christians, but they have some pretty strong differences biblically, uh, more fundamental than a lot of other maybe groups that would claim to be Christians. Um, but... It was interesting because I'd just been really thinking about this passage and mulling over it, preparing it for this week. And one of the ideas that they hold to is that even when you die, you will not be perfect. You still have to continue to work towards salvation after your death. And so they have kind of this purgatory spirit prison idea where you have to continue working out your salvation. It's not that Jesus purchased you and you're, you're saved because you believe in Jesus, which is what the Bible teaches over and over again. Ephesians 2, Romans 10, right, 9 and 10, like all over the place, that's what the Bible teaches. They wouldn't believe that. But here, and I tried to bring up for them, it says Christ will present us perfect when we die. That's the promise that's here. And it's something that we can hold to with confidence. That we will be presented perfect before God by Christ. And, but one thing I left them with, and if you ever run into those folks uh, knocking at your door, I would recommend at the very least just challenge them to read the Gospel of John. There's many, many testimonies of people who have come out of those groups who have been saved because they've been challenged by a believer to read the Gospel of John or some other similar portion of Scripture can be really powerful. Even the book of Colossians would be really good. Um, so if, if you're ever in that spot, that's a good place to leave them with. What this, the Word of God is powerful, and it will change people's lives, even if they're coming from a group that teaches very different things about who Jesus is. Anyways, that's just a footnote. But We've seen we're reconciled to God. We're called to be holy. In Ephesians 1.4, it says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So we've, we're not only going to be presented to God as holy, but this is the reason that God chose us was so that we might be holy. It's the purpose in our salvation. In Ephesians 5.27, it says, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. This is what we were created for. This is why Christ died for us. This is why he gave us the Spirit as a guarantee so that we could, that's Romans 8, talks a lot about how the Spirit is molding us towards holiness. It's what we're to be as believers. At the end of Romans 8, Romans 8 is way too long to unpack in detail here, but at the very end of the chapter, after talking about how the Spirit works through us in our lives and shapes us to be like Christ, it says, verses 31 through 34, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who is raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? God holds us securely. If you are saved today, 
You don't have to worry about your salvation, whether it's going to be lost somehow by something stupid or sinful that we do as believers. We still wrestle with sin. That's why we're not perfect yet. But we are, we are being, we are secured by Christ so that we can be made fully holy, fully blameless when we're brought before God the Father once we've died and once the end of the church age has happened. Paul talks about this too in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. You can jump there on our slide. It says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but I do one thing, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And this is us a lot of times. (laughs) It's not always easy. It's a marathon. But we are pressing on. It's not that we're perfect, we're, we're looking towards that goal. That's what Hebrews 11, 12 talks a lot about. We're pressing on. Our lives are about wrestling, struggling, running towards holiness. It's not that we're there perfectly yet, but we're oriented in that direction. And even as we're battling our imperfections, our sin that's still there in our lives, We are able to become more holy because Christ has bought us and he's he's taken away the consequences of our sins because he's given us the Holy Spirit in our lives that's making us holy. We're able to press on. In Jude 24, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's Jesus. Jesus is the one that makes us blameless. It's not that we're all out on our own, having to flail around. Jesus is the one that is making us holy. We have him as our helper. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. This is our end. This is what we're heading towards. And so, I've titled this sermon, uh, Encouragements to Endure, because we've seen here the first part is talking about where we're coming from, where God has us now. But ultimately, as Paul wraps up this passage in verse 23, he's giving us an encouragement to endure. So he says, don't throw away your confidence. Don't give up your hope. Don't lag. Don't be sluggish partway through. Don't forget about the goal. So in verse 23, he says, if indeed you continue in the faith, right? This is referring back to what he just said, the verse before about Christ will present you holy if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. I want us to zoom in today. We could talk more about the second half, but today we're going to zoom into this first part. Continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. What does that look like in our life? And I want to encourage you from this verse and from Scripture, endure. Don't give up halfway through. Not that if we gave up, we would lose our salvation somehow. The Bible is very clear. John 10 talks about this. 
First John, we're, we're not going to lose our salvation, but Christ is desiring to present us holy and blameless before God, and so he's calling us to live in a way that is shaping us and growing us towards that holiness. And that's what this, verse 23, is talking about, is that shaping and growing. So, first of all, in Philippians 1.6, Paul shares his confidence to the Philippian church, another church in Greece as well, that Paul's writing to while he's in prison. And he's sharing with them in this same vein, saying, you will be saved if you continue in the faith. And then he says in verse 6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So again, it's easy to look at this, if indeed you continue, and say, oh God, I'm not sure, I don't know. I don't know if I can continue. There's just so many pressures. Life is so hard. The world is so tempting. And it is. It is. But what Paul tells the Philippians and what he's telling the Colossians is you will endure because Jesus Christ is at your side strengthening you. You will endure. And so he's not saying this to discourage you or plant seeds of doubt in your mind. He's saying this to encourage you so that you continue in what God has called you to do, and what he's trying to shape you towards. So what does it mean to be steadfast and stable? At the end of the great chapter in 1 Corinthians about resurrection, where Paul has said, resurrection is the foundation, the cornerstone to our faith. You have to believe it or else everything that we stand for, everything that we seek to live out is meaningless. All of this holiness, sanctification talk, garbage, if the resurrection isn't true. At the end of that chapter, he says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, based on the fact that the resurrection is true, right? That's the therefore. He's going back to the rest of the chapter. Therefore, my brothers, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. See, the imagery that's often used in the Bible is of a seed that's planted in our hearts. That's that's the truth of the gospel. We begin to be changed and suddenly our lives are flowering and blossoming with good works. It's not that the fruit that we have in our lives caused us to be saved. It's the seed of the gospel that caused us to be saved. But if you truly have that seed, then you're going to grow fruit because that's the work of the Holy Spirit that's in your life changing you, feeding you, making you want to do works that show that identify you as a believer in Jesus. In Colossians 2.6, so just a few verses later, we'll get here in a couple weeks. He says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So this steadfastness idea is that we are rooted in the Word of God. We're rooted in Jesus. We're founded. The the foundation idea is is really a building metaphor. It's the idea of a house or or a building needs a strong stone or for us today, cement foundation. Otherwise, Anytime a flood comes or the earth moves a little bit, the whole house is going to go sideways. Our foundation is Christ, and everything we do has to be built on that. And so our stability is in Christ. If we truly believe in Christ, we will be able to keep that stability. 
because it's not rooted in our own weaknesses and imperfections. It's rooted in Christ's strength and his perfections. And then in the very next verses in Colossians 2, in verses 7 and 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And so Paul is, again, he's emphasizing, don't let these heretics who are trying to teach you that you need some sort of extra rituals to know the gospel, don't, don't let them take you captive. All you need is Christ. He is the one who will keep you steadfast in the gospel. Secondly, we see under how to be steadfast, we, we see that we have to be grounded in Christ. Secondly, we see that we have to set our hope in God. In 1 Peter 1.13, it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action... And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the redemption, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we're setting our mind on Jesus, we will not be distracted by what the world is calling us to live like. I think that's what Paul means too later on in Colossians 3 verse 1 where he says, verses 1 and 2, Think on the things that are above. Set your mind on the things that are above. Set your mind on Christ. Set your mind on your salvation rather than on the piddling issues that we grapple with in this life. And then we're called to be watchful. In 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10, it says, Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I know I'm reading a different translation than what's up here. It's, it's close. Resist him, firm in the, your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood through, throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you so we're called to be watchful in our lives and we're called to not be apathetic we can't just be falling asleep at our post next slide we're like soldiers guarding a fortress we have to be watchful or else we're going to be attacked behind our backs There's enemies that will wage war against our steadfastness. Two key ones that we fight against all the time, doubt in God and worldly appetites. We constantly have to be watchful against those because they will, they will molt, they'll rot out your faith if you're not careful. So then we're called to focus on the finish line. If we want to be confident if we want to endure, we need to focus on the finish line. Think about what the glories of heaven are that God sent his own son to die for us. How excellent is that rest that God has prepared for us, that he sent God the Son to become man and die for us. How excellent is our eternal rest that we won't face sin and death anymore. We will not live under the curse of sin and temptation. We will not live in the realities of death that, that we have to fight and wrestle against right now. We won't be subject to that. We'll be able to worship God instead of having to have faith. We'll have sight. We'll see God for who he is. So don't be apathetic about your salvation. And don't throw away your first love for God. In, in the beginning of Revelation, Jesus, speaking to John the Apostle, warns against churches that have forgotten their first love for God. Do you treasure God? 
Is, is He what satisfies you in your life? And know that God is giving you a better possession than anything that we can lose in this life. We don't face that much persecution here, but a lot of Christians around the world face intense persecution where they're, they're tortured, they lose their houses, they lose their families. And Paul, Paul writes to the Colossians about this also in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10, 34 through 38, we'll unpack it later on. Paul encourages them because they have been willing to even go to prison for their faith. Because they have the hope in Christ, they know that God has better possessions in store for them. The, the things that we see in heaven, the things that we will have when we enjoy Christ and God in relationship forever in heaven and on the new earth, so far out past the, the realities, the possessions that we have right now, even our time, that we can't compare the two. God is calling us to things that are far better than what we have now. And finally, don't forget the promises of God. Because as we can look back on the Bible, this is part of why it's so important to read this book. Because this is where we can really root our trust in God in. Because if what He says here is true then everything in our life should be shaped around this reality. The fact that God is the creator, what we learned last week about Jesus is the creator. He is in authority over every, every molecule of creation. If that's true, then that should shape who we are and what we do. Some final applications to leave you with. Strive with everything you are to have a holy attitude in your life. It's so easy to do and yet so dangerous to have one of two attitudes in our lives, either kind of this grumpy Christian attitude, or the I'm better than you and, and I don't care about anybody else because I'm so holy and perfect. That's not true of the Bible. Or letting compromise seep into our lives and being, thinking we can sit on the fence and have a little bit of God and a little bit of the world. They don't mix. And any one of those attitudes are going to be trouble for us but rather we're called to live with a holy attitude, which means we're pursuing Christ with every fiber of our being. We're thirsting for God, but we're also seeking to pour, we're, as we're abounding in that thanksgiving, we're seeking to overflow that in our lives with the other people that are around us, whether they're believers or not, so that they see our identity, they see our gratitude towards God, they see that our lives are being shaped by a love for God and a love for other people. This is what we're called to. And so, two final points, keep a watch over your heart. Don't let your life slip into sin. Keep a watch over your heart. And finally, live savoring the beauty of Christ. If you spend all your time looking at the junk food the world has to offer, you'll never be able to really savor God's delicious food realities, right? To, to use a food metaphor. But if most of what you eat is a really savory, tender, I don't know how you guys like it, maybe medium rare, or rare, filet mignon, you're not going to be wanting, you're, you're not going to be drooling over dollar menu hamburgers at McDonald's. You're just not. And if what the Bible says is true, that's, that's the difference in a weak, very metaphorical way. We have, if you will, the filet mignon. 
We have the good stuff. Why would we spend our time drooling over the fake, cheap trash that the world wants to give us? And, but that's part of the attitude change that we're going to have as we become, as we come to know Christ, that we won't see those things as delicious. And that is what God is calling us to, is to savor Christ and savor the holiness, the righteousness that God desires from us and Christ will present us as the end of time. So, well, let's pray, and then we can sing the doxology together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ and his reconciliation in our lives, that even though we were enemies, you made us right with yourself, and you've called us to be holy so that Christ can present us holy before you. And I pray that you would help us to savor the holiness of your character. And I pray that you would help us to endure and and to keep each other accountable that we would endure, that we would be faithful to what you've called us to do, that we wouldn't give up partway through, we wouldn't lose hope, that we would see that what you offer us, what you've given us, if we truly believe, is so much richer and more beautiful and more true and more satisfying than anything that this life can offer.